Good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. I was asked earlier whether I have um, jet lag still. I think it's impossible to have jet lag in a city such as this, uh, with such uh, fantastic sights and sounds and tastes and smells, although I have discovered that ginkgo is a far better medicine than an incense. So not all smells are necessarily better than others. I'd like to um, talk today about turning principles into practice, uh, using my own place as an example of it. This is George Washington Carver, botanist, inventor, environmentalist. He was called the Black Leonardo. George Washington Carver stated, where there is no vision, there is no hope. And in that statement, he perfectly encapsulated the challenges currently faced by communities in villages, shires, regions, and states around the world. As we gather here today in 2017, we know that many are without hope and who believe hope is out of reach. They do so because they see a globalised economy that makes them feel small. It makes them feel outsiders in their own world. They see their local food become part of a global chemical crop, one that sprays more than it plants and threatens a basic right to eat healthy, locally grown food. They see how they live is often closer to being a Lego block in a pattern of millions of others. They see the sky get lost behind concrete. And they see their energy making their planet sicker, even when they try and oppose it. It's hard to tell those who have no hope that they are wrong, especially since those terrible words were uttered in the 19... Sorry. Oh, I have a different uh, PowerPoint. Sorry. Um, especially since those terrible words were spoken by Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, that there is no alternative. But there are alternatives. And there is not one way. And everyone here and around the world who believe that each person, each community, and each economy can and must strive to live together according to their needs and their own way, cannot simply tell those without hope that there are alternatives. Instead, we have to show them. And this was expressed beautifully by the oh. mayor earlier about those children at school. You cannot just tell that those elementary school students to have self-confidence. We cannot tell them that their future is assured. Instead, the school showed them how to build self-confidence through music. Today I'm here to share with you my community and what it's doing to show those without hope that through a strong vision, hope can grow. But before I share the vision within my community and some of the work being undertaken to bring this vision to life, allow me to tell you about my shire. Byron Shire is both a place and an ideal. The place covers an area of 566.7 square kilometres, or just over 200 square miles, and is the easternmost point in Australia. And it is part of the Northern Rivers region in New South Wales. It has a population of just over 30,000. But it is much more than a star on a map. 
This is the sign that greets visitors as they drive into our main town, Byron Bay. The extra line below, welcome to Byron Bay, says, cheer up, slow down, chill out. It's become our motto. And though, of course, we too struggle to live by these ideals, we value them and we keep trying. Economically, Byron Shire is largely dependent on tourism, like yourselves, especially visitation to, again, its town, Byron Bay. Approximately 2 million visitors generate a yearly tourism expenditure estimated to be well over half a billion dollars. And thus, Byron Shire shares the many disruptive challenges that have arisen as a product of globalising our economic and cultural identities and especially under the weight of tourism. Insecure employment, a lack of housing affordability, where houses are the same price as those in Melbourne and Sydney, the sense of losing our unique identity and a state and federal governance system which strips our local communities of decision-making and local flavour. These are further exacerbated by the specific challenges that come from being a small coastal town of 10,000 residents with one road in and one road out, with two million visitors that drive down. Under this pressure, we are still committed to being different to other communities, to being as local and as unique as possible. For us, the alternative to a globalised economy is a local one. We have four different farmers' markets. We have three community gardens. We are the home of the Seed Savers Network. Byron Shire's social sustainability challenge is how best to support our community so we can continue to become being empowered to be guardians of our public spaces. Locals within Byron Shire have a vision for the world and Byron's place in it. It is a vision of local empowerment, respect for the planet and each other, and living in an honourable, sustainable and respectful manner. We actively resist globalised political pressures. We resist fast food chain stores and have defeated efforts of both McDonald's and KFC to enter our town. Some stores are in Byron and so we don't need anything. But we keep trying and we must keep trying. Every globalised fast food store replaces potentially a local food store. We support peace and actively resist polluting centralised energy. We have successfully kept our coal seam gas mining in the area, the only place in Australia where the community stood up to multinational mining companies and said no. Instead, we have committed ourselves to a local, decentralised, renewable energy future now. The Shire's residents have resisted high-rise and suburban sprawl housing. We have a height limit of three storeys. Residents have pioneered the permaculture land use movement, communal, communal living arrangements such as multiple occupancy, alternative medicine and health practices, and have been one of the highest Green Party voting areas in Australia. Our, our council holds these ideals also. This is one of our tourism posters. The slogan down the bottom and at the top above that frog, also a local says, don't spoil us, we'll spoil you. This it itself was a very contentious slogan because it started, according to the businesses, on a negative. You can't say don't to a visitor. Why not? Why can't we put expectations on those who come and visit us? 
so they visit us in a way which makes us strong and doesn't threaten the unique nature of who we are. The second sentence is, we'll spoil you. Of course, some of our local activists didn't like that line because it seemed a bit subservient. I think sometimes when the extreme pro-business and the extreme anti-business are both unhappy, we're perhaps getting somewhere. Underneath, in the language, it says, Byron is a fun place to live and visit. We are not a party town. There are better places to do that sort of thing. In Byronshire, you'll be spoilt with our beaches, rolling green hills, local markets, colourful villages, people and wildlife. We've been protecting the Shire against overdevelopment, loggers and out-of-town politics to keep it that way. That's why we love our Shire with all our heart and all our soul. We are also one of the highest populations of creative industries and creative professionals outside Melbourne and Sydney. And there is barely a wall that is not considered an open canvas. So with this background into both the place of Byron Shire and the ideals that lay behind it and within its people, allow me to turn to the visions we hold and the actions we are creating that will indeed ensure George Washington Carver will happily see that our vision may provide hope. The key two impulses that throb through our community's heart is the belief in collaboration and the desire to put our principles into practice. Firstly, we accept that leaving change only to political levels will not succeed and only leaving it to the citizens will also fail. We all need to work together, council, local experts, organisations, different levels of government and volunteers. And second, we need to act and we need to act now and we need to act in a way that can make it easier for others to follow and to act also. Sorry, that was a bit late. <laughs> Just another little image to capture some of the, the mood and spirit of my town. But these two impulses can be seen in our efforts to decentralise our energy to pursue a goal, to own, control and produce our own energy. As currently the energy sector in Australia is beset by traditional economic systems of corporate monopolies, attachment to fossil fuel generation, and a centralised, highly, hugely expensive energy supply and retail chain. In Australia, our energy prices for residents have doubled in the last three or four years. Allow me to share an occasion and decision which illustrates our thinking and values. In 2015, I received a proposition to receive an investment of $50 million, to receive an investment of $50 million to establish the solar powered microgrid that would make Byron Shire 100% renewable, with all the residents and businesses paying at least 10% below market electricity prices on a 20 year contract. We said no. We thanked the representative from the massive global company and declined the offer. Firstly, right on the cusp of a global energy transition, the community of Byron Shire does not wish to have its control of its energy security transferred from the current global corporations to another. Our community wants to pursue local energy. We want to generate it ourselves. We want to own it ourselves. We want to get all the benefits from it. And we could not see this being delivered by one German energy company. Secondly, a 20-year contract within the flux of the energy revolution is a lifetime. 
most of the buyer and community would be assuming they'd be well and truly generating their own energy from their own individual households within 20 years. The quick and impressive residential take-up of rooftop solar has ensured the wider Northern Rivers area has one of the highest percentages of rooftop solar anywhere in Australia. Thus, we decided to instead focus on establishing our own energy security and transition. We did this mainly through three organisations and collaborating amongst all three and with council. The first of which was Zero Emissions Byron, also called ZEB. ZEB was initiated in, 20, in March 2015 when a meeting between the CEO of the National Think Tank Beyond Zero Emissions and myself sat in my office and hatched a plan to create ZEB as a prototype for regional and national emissions mitigation in Australia and more locally to achieve zero emissions in the Byron Shire by 2025. The desire to dilute centralised control wherever possible was also an explicit component of ZEB's mission. But ZEB goes beyond simply increasing renewable energy. It tackles the main sources of emissions across the whole Shire. Energy, buildings, transport, land use and waste to trigger major social, economic and environmental benefits. Zero Emissions Byron Limited was incorporated as a non-for-profit company limited by guarantee with charity status. Quickly it focused on three project stages. Calculating the baseline of our current emissions across energy, transport, buildings, land use and waste. Develop 10 year action plans to get to zero across each and to implement, monitor and adjust short term practical actions such as energy efficiency and rooftop solar and longer term strategies to move to zero emissions. Community members interested in working on the project signed up to participate in five working groups covering each of the identified sectors and by August 2015 the five volunteer working groups supported by peer reviews from Beyond Zero Emissions had started phase one which was establishing the baseline greenhouse gas emissions audit for each sector in order to clarify and prioritise emission sources because quite simply we cannot manage what we cannot measure. Zeb completed this task in May 2016. Apologies for all the English there, but I'll tell you the key components. The baseline calculations came to 263,000 tonnes across the Shire, across those five sectors per year. This equates to eight tonnes per person which is half the Australian average, although nearly double the global average. Stage two is now well underway with the first action plan focusing on energy now complete. Zeb commissioned a report which aimed to help identify and implement the most appropriate mix of renewable energy and energy efficiency to reduce our electricity emissions to zero by 2025. Collaboration has now taken root in ZEP. It now sits formally alongside Council, with Council now taking on a lead role, formalised by recent Council resolutions, allocating uh, the role of funding, putting some staffing towards to sit alongside ZEP, and to develop the action plans of the remaining four sectors. Moving forward, community engagement and grassroots collaboration with Council will continue to be an integral strength of ZEP. Another local success story in collaboration and acting to create a decentralised local energy future can be seen in ANOVA. ANOVA Community Energy is Australia's first and only community-owned energy retailer. It is based in the Byron Shire and it is 75% owned by people living in the Northern Rivers region. 
It is a social enterprise with objectives to assist communities to reduce carbon emissions and to benefit the community by enabling all to participate in the shift to renewables, not just those who can afford to. Being a social enterprise, in addition to the retail arm, a not-for-profit arm, and over community limited, a registered charitable organisation has been established to receive 50% of profits in order to deliver their programs. Its aim is to build an energy conscious community that shares common goals and to keep profits and jobs in the community, reduce the, car the region's carbon footprint, create an energy supply model that benefits all socio-economic groups, and establish an energy supply model that, begin that can be recreated by communities across the country. To influence government policy, and ultimately produce enough re renewable energy locally to meet all our needs. Alison Crook, the, Ch the ANOVA Chair, said, our vision is to assist communities around Australia to take control of and own their own power. We see that the future of energy is renewable, decentralised and distributed. ANOVA took 18 months from concept through feasibility study business plan, retail licence application and capital raising to raise $4 million from 1,100 investors. It took six months to recruit and train staff and establish and test systems. Innova has now been offering services for 12 months and has more than 3,000 customers, of which I'm proud to be one. And it has a target to double that in the next 12 months. Already ANOVA is purchasing from local rooftops more than 40% of the volume of electricity that they are using and selling. At the time of, of uh, presenting to you today, ANOVA has three pilot projects for generation within the Shire and is soon to launch a solar garden targeting renters. Corum is another local example of collaboration and turning vision into action. It stands for community-owned renewable energy Mullumbimby. Mullumbimby is another town within my shire. It's a not-for-profit community action group dedicated to setting up community-owned renewable energy projects in the Mullum area and in the pursuit and promotion of a 100% renewable energy future. After a hugely successful campaign to stop coal seam gas mining in the region, Corum was formed as a result of a small group discussion on ways it can create solutions. Corum's vision is, that, is one that also celebrates and is empowered by community engagement and ownership. Recently it facilitated a solar battery bulk buy scheme and, up, and over 100 participants had purchased 424 kilowatts of solar and 600 kilowatts of storage, while also raising $20,000 for flood victims, which happened in our area recently. Its most striking project was formulated at its first meeting to reactivate Mullumbimby's original hydroelectric power station. It was one of the first in, in Australia. It was first turned on in December 1925, powered the whole of Mullumbimby, and by the time, it, uh, within a few years, also powered local towns Bangalore and Byron Bay, and was decommissioned in 1990. The vision is for it to again energise Mullumbimby. The proposal envisions a community-owned company with a minimum of 51% membership in the Mullumbimby area, producing up to one megawatt via a pumped hydro storage system. Although only in the preliminary stages, the project has had negotiations with ARENA, which is the main federal government renewable energy funding body, five state government agencies and departments, council, the grid network owners, Charles Sturt University, and Corum. And from this meeting, it has been shown that it is possible. One problem is the bureaucratic minefield and hoops it has to jump through. A hydroelectric scheme is 
considered the same no matter how big it is. So it has to jump through the same regulatory hoops as the massive Snowy Mountains hydro scheme that, that uh, powers a lot of our country. In fact, within the Office of Environment and Heritage in New South Wales alone, there are 19 different steps that have to be taken and approved uh, uh, before it can move forward. A project that will bring together ZEB, ANOVA, Corum, and Council has also been announced. I convened on September 1 this year, 20 days ago, the Byron Energy Action Tank. It merged local players, including Council, ANOVA, Corum, local energy providers, specialists, and national counterparts, to find a way to get to 100% of our energy for it to be 100% locally owned and to have this either built or created um, or projects approved by September 1, 2019, in two years. In the afternoon session that I'm a part of to dealing with renewable energy, I'll explore far, in far more detail this project, including the stages we're going through to realise its vision. This will not be a council project, it will be a community project. It will not be one project on one piece of land, it requires at least 70 megawatts. But various projects in various forms in various locations. Council will be a leader as we should, but success isn't dependent on council. Council may invest and profit from owning solar infrastructure and use this for wider community projects we may support others to do so. In fact, we'll do both. One such site is Council's land at Valances Road. The Valances Road sewage treatment plant could become an exemplar development for a fully realised collaborative community focused precinct and the formal uh, resolution to move on it will be occurring in the next two months with construction of some of the stages to start in the early year. It will consist of a biomass crop site and bioenergy generator, a solar farm, an affordable housing precinct and a large biodiversity enhancement in partnership with local environmental and land care groups. Alongside the pursuit of turning vision into action into the field of renewable energy, Council will also be shortly increasing its commitment to community collaboration in its major strategic decision making. As I mentioned at the start, that for many, the virus of globalisation brings with it an overbearing sense of hopelessness. It also presents opportunities between communities, states and nations to learn from each other and teach each other. This can be wonderfully illustrated through the work that Byron Shire Council is undertaking in the development of its overarching 10-year community strategic plan. A major review and consultation process will be held in 2017-2018 to prepare this new plan that will enshrine and articulate the values of the community, its priorities and its vision. And to assist this development process, Council will be learning from the nation of Bhutan and its Gross Happiness Index. Bhutan uses Gross National Happiness, or GNH, to evaluate, monitor, set goals and raise national consciousness about conditions that are conducive to well-being. Contrasting with the common Western perceptions of happiness as the fleeting experience of pleasure, well-being best describes the Bhutanese concept of happiness. An important part of the GNH tool screening process has been the development of an Excel tool. This application is used by the GNH Commission to assess and review all draft policies, programs, and projects in Bhutan through a GNH lens. Whilst it's not the determining factor for ultimate approval or endorsement, GNH screening highlights specific recommendations and feedback to review all proposals within the scope of the nine domains and Byron Shire Council will do the same. The nine domains are living standard, good governance, 
education, health, ecology, community vitality, time use and balance, culture and psychological well-being. Originating from a local resident applying for and receiving a Charles Sturt University Rural and Regional Community Initiative grant to initiate a research project of embedding a GAG, a gross happiness index layer into a local government planning system, we put our hands up to be that case study. And the ease of the application and benefits of this soon became apparent. As with the use of G&H in Bataan, Council could establish working to increase wellbeing or happiness in Byron Shire as a driving force for Council. Working with the community to screen all of our policies and projects using a modified G&H tool, incorporating our current themes and aims to reassure the community that Council is implementing a community strategic plan in all of its decisions and provide a way for the community to actively participate in this process. Recently, Council voted to include the development of the wellbeing framework to inform this decision making. Sitting alongside possibly other leading wellbeing and happiness frameworks, both nationally and internationally, the Gross Happiness Index work from Bhutan will certainly be included as part of this mix. George Washington Carter's musing that where there is no vision, there is no hope is as true now as when he uttered it. Within Byron Shire, the community continues to try and match its vivid, imaginative conception of a more localised and democratic systems under which to live with bold and relentless actions to fully realise what this will look like. We look forward to taking this journey along other, alongside other communities. I'll finish my time with you today, or this morning, with this image. Surfing is more than a pastime in Byron. It is a chance to connect with each other, with nature and with oneself. It is part of the Byron DNA. This particular photo is taken from the 1960s and it is a photo of a local surfing legend, Rusty Miller, when he was the US surfing champion throughout the 1960s. I use it because it sums up the choice that is facing us. We could be that person who is paddling and watching relying only on hope and missing the opportunities that are facing him. He did not have the vision to paddle further out and now he has no hope of catching the wave as it passes. Or we can be rusty. He had the vision to act, to paddle harder, faster, and for longer than others. And now his vision has led to his hope of riding atop the wave coming alive. It also highlights the importance of how we react to change in front of us. We have choices. There is alternative. We can lay on our boards and hope, or we can act. And we can then gain all the benefits from riding this wave, the social, environmental, and economic benefits that come from being a leader of change. It is our choice. It is our responsibility. The world needs individual communities around the world to stop paddling and to stand up and ride the wave. Your wave will be different to mine. Your community's wave will be different to Byron's. Byron, I know, has the head, heart and will, the expertise, passion and activist energy to acknowledge the problem, demand to be part of the solution 
and get to work to make it happen. I also, after these last few days, have no doubt that Jean Zhu also has the head, the heart and the will. When we all keep pushing, keep working, keep inspiring and keep acting to live within a localised footprint as local people, as local communities, and with all our local differences and challenges, we will inspire those with no hope and no vision to join us. No one can do this alone. But in the perf powerful words of E. F. Schumacher, I can't myself raise the winds that might blow us or the ship into a better world, but I can at least put up the sail so that when the winds come, I can catch it. Let's sail together. Let's ride this wave together. And let's be local together. Thank you.